I would like to share an observation about my youngest daughter. She's three years old, and she likes to build Lego towers. And this process is quite a challenge for her, given her young age. And imagine this situation after an intense work of maybe half an hour as she has finally finished her tower. I grab my phone to take a photo, wanting to share it in the family chat, but she doesn't let me take that photo. She steps back, she takes a deep breath, she runs, and she knocks it down. And she is not disappointed. She laughs happily because she has this playful attitude which doesn't estimate or calculate like how much input she made into something and how big the output is. And she didn't do it for a picture to be posted in the family chat. It was a natural process to her. I'm going to talk about playfulness, which at the first glance just seems to be a way to take things easy in a relaxed and joyful manner, which is also true, especially in my filmmaker's work, which often means play, uh, d working days and nights, over time, uh, sometimes doing a lot of work, which doesn't bring any results at all. For example, you work on the production design for a certain scene, and after shooting it, you realize that it just doesn't fit in the film. But somebody, maybe a dozen of people, have been working on it for weeks. In those moments, I try to take the example of my youngest daughter, this disproportion between the time and energy she spends on building her tower and the joyful moment of destroying it. What saves her from this calculation, it's such a hassle, why bother? That's her playful view. She never asks herself, do I have the inspiration to play today? <laughs> she can grab a puppet she has played with so many times before, just as fresh as if she was doing it for the first time. But actually, playfulness is not only about joy and fun. To me, it's one of the crucial concepts to describe the reality we all experience. Things come and go, thoughts and feelings come and go, and this whole visible reality, as quantum physicists explain, it can be seen as a play, a play of energy in space, uh, a play of particles popping in and popping out of existence. And this is my view of reality, too, and I try to apply it in my filmmaker's work as well. My work, to some extent, means playing with people, and unfortunately, for the sake of film, of course, sometimes it means playing people. Through my experience in film, including my playwriting studies, which often means uh, constantly looking for outer and inner conflicts, I have developed a certain tendency. I deliberately like to choose difficult topics. Actually, the more difficult, the better, because then I somehow feel like then it's worth spending years of my and my colleagues' lives on that. Several years ago, I decided to shoot a story about incest something that Latvian institutions were not prepared for. It was a real case of an incestuous relationship. A young Latvian woman living in the middle of nowhere with uh, her real brother, and they had two kids. For some reason, Latvian law doesn't say actually anything against an incestuous relationship. And nobody actually cared. So when the brother and the sister had the first child, the local council just didn't do anything. And while the authorities were still thinking of what to do, a second child was born. And then the local council thought, OMG, we made a mistake, a very, very big mistake. So an incestuous family with two children, that was the point when my cameraman and I came along. 
And we discovered that it wasn't just an incestuous family. There was also violence involved, both physical and emotional violence. The brother was put in jail briefly for one year as there was little evidence of his violence. And the film's topic was, will Zanda, the main protagonist, will she be able to change her life during her brother's absence? An eventually strong topic, but there was a little problem as soon as we switched on the camera. Zanda, her neighbors, these socially isolated characters, they were unable, actually, to move and talk in front of the camera. Zanda was even hardly able to speak, even during a very simple interview, and the same with the other characters. We tried everything. We offered them to just do some everyday activities without talking to us, but nothing really worked. So, at first we thought, oops, there is no film. The characters are not ready to be filmed. But then, Playfulness came into play. We thought, what if we offer them this kind of game? I suggest them to do some actions. Very simple, step by step, like everyday activities, fetch water from a well, cut wood with a saw. I direct, they perform, step by step. By the way, it's... Uh, hard to describe their living conditions. I dare say that most of you haven't even set your foot in such a place. Zanda lived under one roof with her mother, several stepbrothers, and a varying number of other neighbors. Nobody had a job, and the benefits were mostly spent on alcohol. And I remember that one day Zanda had an issue with the electricity bill. And again, nobody was able to pay, and we offered her to try to collect the money from the neighbors in front of the camera, and we talked to the neighbors separately, asked them what they would do in such situation. And we prompted them to action what to do when Zander will enter their room. So it was a performance, and they made this performance, and we shot it, and I'll tell you that the scene, it looked just amazing. It was very good acting. And remember, we're talking about a documentary film here. So, we made a number of such scenes, and gradually less and less direction was needed. Zanta and others quickly learned to improvise, and they offered some episodes of their lives, played them out in front of the camera, which gave a lot of inspiration, not only to us, because the shooting finally went well, but also to the characters. Suddenly, the hardships of their lives had got transformed into these strange, improvised scenes. Zand and others became so good in acting that they could even repeat their words and actions in several takes in a row, just like in fiction films, and that was the problem. It was not a documentary film anymore. We didn't even know what to call this experiment. Like, it was somewhat unusual for documentary filmmaking. Reenacting? It wasn't reenacting. Possibly the closest term one might apply to what we did. But stop. On the other hand, things were not so bad. These characters, especially Zanda, they had not only become able to move and talk in front of the camera, she had even become capable of smiling and laughing. And we shot more and more, and we got a lot of real documentary stuff as well. But don't get me wrong, this film is not about happy people at all. There is a lot of heaviness, poverty, alcoholism, and even physical violence in the film. And there were many issues for us as filmmakers, those moments when you just can't decide whether to keep on shooting or to intervene what's happening between the characters. There were several men consuming alcohol in almost lethal amounts, and one of them tried to seduce Zanda. And since he failed, he tried to hang himself on a branch of a tree. We asked him if he would be able to show his love in a different way, and he came in while we were shooting with a corkscrew 
screwed right in the middle of his chest. Was that a documentary film at that moment? I don't know, and I still don't know. Was that ethically acceptable? When he entered covered with blood, there were Zanda's children in the room. Another time, we asked if Zanda would be ready to talk about her relationship with another local guy who also apparently fell in love with her. And she and he, they both said yes, and we shot something the documentary filmmakers very rarely get to shoot, a romantic dialogue, which was so fake because they both knew they were being filmed. So it was slippery stuff. Our playfulness had reached a point a very sleazy point. Here playing with people and playing people just merged into one. We finished the film, we called it Family Instinct, and it did really well. We traveled to many film festivals around the world, it got awards and prizes, but still there was this one question. Had something actually changed in lives of Sanda and her children? The brother came out of jail. And right, bef right before we finished the shooting, and then came this sense of responsibility too. So he came out and he said that everything's just fine, but you guys have to say goodbye quickly and let us just be. But we saw Zanda's despair and her fear of her brother. And then we crossed the red line. We asked Zanda, if she would like to start a new life without her brother. And she said, 100%, yes. And with the help of our friends, we found a new home for her, still in Latvia, but in a completely different place. And there's the second unusual thing we did. We, we ourselves helped her to escape from the brother. So Zanda and her children, they looked happy in her new home. But after two weeks, she called me and she said that she and the children, they're hitchhiking on the road back to their father, to her brother. So, again, it looked like everything we did was completely pointless. But then a miracle happened. The local authorities offered her another chance to move out to a social apartment. And this time, Zanda, finally accepted. And now that years have passed, at last I can say that her and her children's lives are not the same as they were before. She still lives in a separate village, separately from the brother, and what's most important, the children, they go to a regular school, unlike their parents and unlike all the other characters from the film. They all, without a single exception, they went, they had gone to Soviet boarding schools. And even though some psychologists may think that I'm a wrong example of art therapy or psychodrama, I truly believe that uh, Zanda's life changed through our common play, transforming her hardships into our film. I myself, despite all the success we had with the film, Family Instinct, I felt kind of transformed too. After all of this endless playing with people and playing people, I felt the need to switch, to switch to fiction films. I quit documentaries, but in a way this, this one documentary is still going on. I stepped into those people's lives and in a way I'm still in there. And there is no happy end, by the way. Zanda still lives on benefits, sometimes does some casual jobs like collecting berries. We're still in touch, by the way. She calls me at least once a month, and I try to find time for at least a short conversation. And what gives me a good feeling is that she usually tries to make it light, like, are you still working on the same film as a month ago, or did you have enough time to make a new one? <clears throat> so our connection to her, it still means having fun together and playing around. Is it right to keep this connection with her? I don't know, and I don't think that anybody knows that. The only thing I know that 
at that point when we first met, Zanda's case seemed to me completely insolvable. By now it looks like she has found at least a little distance from her life situation. And this is something I try to do too, to find, to keep healthy distance, to take things less seriously, which doesn't mean being irresponsible, just the opposite. To learn to become more flexible and to play out the best scenario when times are tough. I'm still learning how to play and my youngest daughter is a good teacher to me. And I look enviously at her, how she manages to destroy her super tall Lego tower, even before I take the photo of it. I myself still haven't let go of that one documentary film. And there's also something I'd like to adjust in my filmmaker's playground. It's uh, to switch from playing people to playing with people. Thank you. <laughs>